I want to talk about carbs in the realm of sugar versus starches. We've been talking about carbs, you know, as a whole and bringing them down. We could put sugar in its own category, processed sugar. And, you know, being a human, all of us are going to have interactions with that at times. Whether we partake or not, that's a different answer. But when it comes to, say, like white rice versus fruits and these different molecules under that heading of carbohydrates, let's talk about how you differentiate those, if at all, when we're looking at carbohydrates and bringing those down. Right. The first thing I'll say is you definitely can reduce it into various categories and molecules that have different effects. So I can tell you about the metabolic effects or the glycemic index of something like sucrose, which is a disaccharide made of glucose and fructose. And we can talk about glucose and how it hits the bloodstream really quickly and will spike your blood sugar about fructose. And fructose has some really interesting, unique metabolic properties, promoting de novo lipogenesis, the generation of new fat, despite the fact that it has a lower glycemic index, yada, yada, yada. I'm throwing out a lot of jargon there intentionally to point out we can dissect, and I'm very happy to, the metabolic impacts of different forms of carbohydrates. However, when we do that, I think sometimes we risk taking them out of the context of the foods that they're consumed as a part of. And the, that context really matters. So if I tell you something about fructose, and I do this routinely, talk about that, you know, as an abstraction, I want people to understand it's not necessarily saying something bad about blueberries, which have some fructose, not actually that much, but also many other compounds that will impact their overall impact on metabolic health. But with that said, high level, I would say you have your starches, which are things like potatoes, pastas, cereals, grains, rice, which are kind of chains of uh, glucose. Starch is the storage form of glucose in plants, just like glycogen is in humans. And so that gets broken down into simpler sugars. Um, it can get broken down pretty fast in some cases. So just because it's more complex doesn't mean it's not going to be broken down fast into simple sugars. And then you have the simpler sugars, things like, you know, lactose and sucrose are disaccharides. You have monosaccharides, which means single sugar like glucose and fructose and galactose. Um, and very basically, things that are sweeter have simpler sugars, provided you don't have non nutritive sweeteners. So, you know, we can think in a category as well. What's sweeter, a ripe banana or a not ripe banana? A ripe banana is sweeter. Why? Because actually it has more sugar. Um, or let's say take papaya and mango and contrast that to blueberries. Blueberries are not nearly as sweet. Why? They have less simple sugar. They have less sweet sugar. So as a general rule of thumb, things that are sweeter are going to have more simple sugar. And again, as a general rule of thumb, these things are going to hit the bloodstream faster. And all things being equal which they aren't necessarily, they're going to have a harder impact on your metabolic health. I'll pause there. No, I mean, that's this is what I'm looking at, just getting into some of the nuance here and how people, again, I'm going to pull you back to the practical, given that, is there anything on a practical level we need to consider when taking in these different foods, when we're extrapolating to our carbohydrates as a whole throughout a day or a week? I think rule number one is generally eat real food, real whole food. Um, the processing of carbs in particular um, generally will impact their glycemic index, how fast they hit the bloodstream. In fact, it's interesting. People talk about like, oh, ultra processed foods are bad, yada, 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 which I think as a heuristic they are. When we investigate, well, what does that actually mean and why are they bad metabolically? Pro processing of fats and proteins doesn't necessarily cause adverse metabolic effects per se. I mean, olive oil is a processed fat, for example. Processing of carbohydrates tends to make them hit the blood sugar a little bit harder. So I think eating carbohydrates that are from whole foods is step number one. Then I think focusing more on like low-carb vegetables 
that are higher in fiber, all things being equal, even if the fiber is a proxy for a lower glycemic index, is useful. These things tend to be lower in overall carb carbs too. So if you think about like a side dish, I mentioned that mashed cauliflower earlier, like a big head of cauliflower or broccoli, there are some carbs there. Um, but the carbohydrate load and the glycemic load are very low. So I would definitely choose, say, having a uh, head of roasted cauliflower. Maybe you can partially boil it, then you roast it, put on some like, you know, curry seasonings can be really nice as compared to something like candied yams. Um, so focusing on low carb vegetables, I think in the category of fruits, if you're going to have fruits, the um, lowest glycemic load, um, at the ones that hit your blood sugar, the the slowest and the least tend to be berries, strawberries, raspberries, blueberries, especially wild blueberries, blackberries, whatever. Berries are typically pretty good as compared to tropical fruits. Bananas, papaya, um, watermelon, they tend to have very high glycemic indices and hit the blood sugar a lot harder. doesn't mean you can't ever have them. It just means, you know, that mango and that blueberry are not equivalent, metabolically speaking. The mango is going to probably hit you harder if you have insulin resistance and metabolic dysfunction. So, you know, it's making those informed trades. If you're going to have fruit, what fruit it's going to be. And I would say generally blueberries um, will be a good option and citrus fruits as well, um, or berries in general and citrus fruits. Uh, in the category of more starchy like foods, you can get some that are higher if, if you're going to consume these higher in protein and fiber, things like quinoa, if you can make quinoa actually taste good, I'm not a particular fan, um, or like things like lentil and legume based carbohydrate substitutes like, like a lentil pasta, a red lentil pasta you could do. Um, there are also substitutes that are very low carb, like shirataki noodles, which are made from like glucomannan fiber. Warning, they cause constipation and people predisposed to constipation. So if I ate them, I'd be clogged up for a while, but that's in part because they're basically just soluble fiber. So they're going to sop up water. They're going to slow your digestive tract, which is going to probably keep you fuller for longer. So if you're not worried about constipation, you want to eat something that is carb-like, look up shirataki noodle keto stir fry, and you'll learn how to make a great stir fry with shirataki noodles, maybe various vegetables, chicken that could be absolutely delicious and be a practical swap for you on a carbohydrate restricted diet journey. There are lots of tips and tricks and things you can discover in this space once you go digging, including just changing the way you cook a particular food. So you can cook sweet potatoes in a way that optimizes, say, the resistant starch, um, which lowers the glycemic load, or even just focusing on, let's say, I'm going to you know, boil this or steam it versus bake it. So like a baked sweet potato has a much higher glycemic load than a boiled sweet potato. Um, you can actually kind of tell. You, imagine baking a sweet potato. I don't know if you ever have it. You know how like it caramelizes and the juices come out and it has a really sweet flavor if you put it in the oven in tin foil. If you boil it, it doesn't have that. Those are metabolically distinct. Even though it's the same potato, you might have cooked it for the same time. They're going to have different impacts on your metabolism. So there's lots of levels here. And the reason I want to highlight all the levels, maybe there's some practicals that have been sprinkled in here, but there's always things to be curious about and tweak and learn. So you might be someone like me who likes to be all or nothing and wants to just go like, say, even full carnivore diet and just eat meat and eggs for a while. But if you're not that person, or even if you were that person and now you're trying to reintroduce carbohydrates, the fact that there are an infinite number of things to tweak and see if they work for you, I think is pretty exciting and provides the basis for infinite hope and self-exploration, which if you can find the fun in that, like that is the key to success. If you enjoyed that clip, you're gonna wanna head over here and catch the full episode. I'll see you over there. Towards the end of college, I started developing GI upset with basically anything I ate. So I ended up becoming quite desperate and after trying a bunch of medications that uh, didn't end up really working to keep me in remission or help my symptoms, I tried a bunch of different diets because I was desperate.